Here's my top 10 tips on how to build a deck or remodel one. I've built and remodeled numerous deck projects in the past, and personally, the framing portion of any construction project is actually one of my favorite parts. Whether it's a deck barely off the ground, a 50 foot long behemoth like this one attached to a poolside, or copious demo and remodels, I've done quite a few. The problem is, however, when doing tutorial based content is no two deck projects are the same, which is why I'm going to give you my top 10 framing tips that I wish I knew about sooner, which will also help any deck remodeling project or any new construction build out there. For this particular project though, we are mainly going to focus in on this remodeling project, even though these helpful tips will come in very handy with new construction as well. I might enjoy the framing process, but the funnest part of any deck remodeling project is the demo portion because it is always satisfying to destroy something that has seen a lot of wear and tear over the years. And that is no exception with this old railing as well as the decking boards below. My all time favorite tool to have on hand with the demo portion is a reciprocating saw because it makes quick work of many different types of construction debris as well as there's multiple different blades to choose from and get through wood and metal at the same time. So with any deck project, you're going to have waste, especially if it's with a remodel. So what are you going to do with that waste to make sure it's as easy as possible to get it out of your site with as little labor as possible? Well. Let me show you. Getting yourself a container is one of my very top tips on how to do a remodeling or home improvement project. And this is something that I really do wish I did sooner because early on in my career, I just took multiple loads of the dump over and over and over again. And that not only wasted time, but I could have also been using that time to help build and remodel the deck itself. I originally thought, hey, this is gonna save me money because I'm only gonna be spending 20 or so dollars every dump load versus three to $600 to rent a dumpster. Well, think about how much your time is actually worth. If it's really just about the end all be all dollar amount, then yes, multiple trips to the dump is gonna be cheaper, but it's so much more efficient to be able to throw all of your construction debris into a small container that's right in front of the house versus who knows how far your local landfill is. Plus, whether this project is for yourself or the general homeowner, there always seems to be a number of items that have been laying around the house just too long and no one's taken the time to take them to the dump and therefore having a nice large dumpster in the very front of your house is a perfect way to get rid of them in a very quick and orderly fashion. On this deck remodeling project, the deck boards were a goner, but the joists were actually still in quite good condition, so we are going to salvage those joists. Unfortunately, all the screws were weathered too significantly, so we had to take the reciprocating saw to every single one. But with the vast majority of the demo taken care of, we can move on to my second tip, the laser level. I'm a man with a lot of tools, and there are very few tools out there where I've actually regretted not purchasing sooner. The laser level is one of those tools. I've used this all the time, whether it's a deck project, a shed, patio, or even mundane things like hanging up a few picture frames around the house, it comes in extremely handy. So if there's one tool that I suggest having on hand that is like a larger purchase where you don't think you need it, well, guess what? Definitely saved my bacon numerous times. Get yourself one if you're doing a deck project. This certainly is not a video where I want you to feel like I'm trying to sell you numerous tools and materials that you need for your project, but I use this thing all the time and I truly do wish I purchased it sooner. The reason why it's so impactful is that you're easily able to pinpoint exactly the height needed for post adjustments. On this particular project, I had to transfer the height of certain posts to lower posts on the opposite side of the deck. Being able to transfer that height to all the other posts and taking much of the guesswork out is extremely straightforward and time-saving. 
The laser level helped me on this remodeling project. However, it's extremely helpful on new construction because it always comes down to lining up the ledger board perfectly with our concrete footings if it's a low profile deck. On this particular project, I had to transfer our laser level dimension to the very top of our concrete footings. And once I had that, I could place our beam and our joist and check to see if we're level. We were, and that's why we had a perfect run all the way across that encompassed two French doors and two windows, which needed to be pinpoint accurate. And as you can see, it worked out, thanks to the laser level. Getting back to the project at hand, you may need to utilize old lumber with new lumber, and unfortunately not all lumber comes the same thickness. Be mindful of materials that are supposed to be the same height, but are very different. These both are supposed to be four by sixes, and this one that was already here is approximately a little under five and a half inches. This one is over five and a half inches, which means we're off approximately three eighths, which is definitely a big difference. This one's gonna be an easy fix. The joists, however, are not. So I'll show you how it's done. This beam correction was actually quite a straightforward problem to solve because by striking a line on the bottom side and noting exactly where that bracket is, I then transfer that line all the way around that section and use an electric hand planer to plane down this section perfectly to the same thickness as the beam adjacent to it. As I move this beam over to check that we have proper thickness cut, it leads me into tip number three making sure you always have some extra pressure treated solution on hand. Pressure treated solution is quite important, especially for pressure treated lumber. And as you can see, when we're cutting this material, sometimes this doesn't soak all the way through and therefore having a solution to apply to it first will still preserve this wood as best as possible before it's here for decades, hopefully. I am aware that our pressure treated material here in the Pacific Northwest does look different than those on the East Coast because of different types of climate, but there still is added pressure treated solution that you can apply to any lumber out there in the exterior elements. I generally recommend applying this product with a stiff bristle brush like a chip brush because you can obviously easily throw this type of brush away and not have to worry about trying to wash it off later on. And this particular product should be applied to any pressure treated lumber in which you placed a cut in, especially on horizontal surfaces, because those areas are obviously more prone to water damage because water can actually rest and absorb into the wood more easily. I apply the solution on beams, joist ends, and even post bases because I want to guarantee that we have as much protection as possible for this lumber. And speaking of protection, let's get to flashing tape. Flashing tape. Now this is something that is extremely important because of the fact that we use composite decking quite often. And back in the day, the decking itself was always gonna degrade earlier than the joists or the beams or the posts. Nowadays, these are gonna be degrading even faster than our decking. So we need to make sure and do our due diligence to make sure that these last as long as possible. Flashing tape is a perfect opportunity to do so. And they come in multiple sizes for your joists or your beam. Composite decking is so widely used these days that flashing tape has become a huge industry and it really is an extremely nominal cost when you consider the overall cost of a deck. Plus, it's not very time consuming to add. Between the flashing tape that I applied to the beams as well as the joists, it probably only took me an hour to do. The overall thought process here is just to make sure that your structural lumber lasts as long as humanly possible because no matter what, the composite decking material is going to last longer than a pressure treated joist beam. This is always a very satisfying step because it is very easy and straightforward, plus it means that you're close to the end of the project, but we're not quite here yet. Let's get back to actually installing our joists. Just as I noted with the beam height discrepancy, we also have joist height discrepancy as well, and that could really screw up the layout of our decking once our decking is installed. Before you install any joists, you should line them all up and figure out which ones are your tall joists and which ones are your short joists, and mark them accordingly. 
Unfortunately, these days we don't have our joists all the same thickness. I've seen these joists go from six and a quarter inch to six and five eighths, and that will really screw with your measurements if you're not prepared for it. So make sure you have all your joists line up first and figure out which ones are small versus tall. And if there's just one or two of the tall ones, get them out of there or plane them down. Once I go through all of my new lumber and know which ones are the high ones and which ones are the low ones, I can start laying out all of my framing. And for framing, I always suggest doing a picture frame border, no matter what type of deck project it is. This is a very simple and straightforward framing solution to make your project go from a DIY project to an extremely professional looking deck layout. The key element here is proper spacing. Our deck boards are five and a half inches wide, and therefore the center of our doubled up joist should be approximately five and a half inches away from the edge. However, we are also applying fascia to the side of our rim joist, which means our fascia is a half inch thick, and therefore I'm subtracting three quarters of an inch of that five and a half inches, so I'm actually only leaving four and three quarters inch from the edge of our deck to the center of our doubled up joist, if that makes sense. In order to install my picture frame joist on the other side of the deck, I did have to remove our stairs. And as you can see, just as a side note, don't have lumber in contact with the ground. It will degrade quickly. Once I bring over and install the remaining deck boards for our picture frame installation, I can move on to the rest of our joist. And this is where tip number seven comes into play, joist spacing. In the past, you would normally see 16 inches on center, but now because we're using composite decking, you may want to go to 12 inches on center because a lot of the composite decking is getting softer and softer to avoid heat buildup. Yes, if you remember any of the old composite decking, it was extremely hot any time there was sun out, and the boards themselves were very heavy and dense, and that's why you didn't have to really worry about the boards bending over time because they were so stiff. But nowadays, they are avoiding the heat buildup and making it lighter, which also makes the product softer, and that means you may want to consider 12 inches on center versus 16. On this particular project, I am still sticking with 16 because that's what is existing on this deck, but I will give you a few helpful tips and tricks when installing composite decking in my next video, so please stay tuned for that and make sure you're subscribed. After I installed all my Joyce Hurricane ties, I went back around and added a bit more blocking into the areas that I know I'm going to have a railing post located at. But once I have all my blocking accounted for at this point, I can move on to making sure every single one of these joists is at the proper elevation. At some point of any deck project I take on, even if it's brand new wood, it seems like I need to plane down one or two boards. That's where the electric planer comes into play because this guy saves me a lot of time and energy to try and get this thing perfectly flat as possible. And to plane down one board or two, the electric planer really does a quick, masterful job at it. Just be careful. <laughs> I've already showed off the electric planer in a previous tip, and this really coincides with checking your material thickness, so it really doesn't deserve its own pro tip. But the one that does deserve another tip is blocking. Adding center support blocking to any deck really does provide a benefit to the deck itself. I've seen plenty of deck projects that do not use blocking, including the one that I even built for my home years and years ago. But in all honesty, it is a quick and easy add that you can do to a deck that will help support the deck's longevity and stiffness, as well as it making it even safer to walk on. Especially if you have a tall deck off the ground, safety is key, and having a stiffer deck framing to walk across is always beneficial in my book. Plus, in some areas throughout the nation, they do have tendency to have joists that actually warp and twist over time, and this will definitely prevent that from happening. At least much less likely to happen. You may have to purchase a couple extra boards for this type of blocking, but if you do it right, you actually might also be able to use all the extra framing waste that has been accumulated over the framing process. After I snap a string line across the center of our joist framing, I then stagger our bracing, which actually makes it a lot easier to nail off properly. With all of our framing taken care of, we can move on to our flashing tape for our joist and our blocking. 
This is part of tip number four, which was adding flashing tape when I was adding it to the beam. But just remember that this tape does come in multiple sizes. And because our joists are only an inch and a half wide, this tape is two inches wide, which fits over our joists perfectly and drapes over both sides of them. With all of our flashing tape attached to our joists, we can get to flashing, specifically metal flashing that is. Flashing is one of the most important elements to any deck project, whether it's a new build or a remodel. We want to guarantee that we have proper protection of our house and we're not de jeopardizing the longevity of our house with a deck, even though how beautiful it is. So unfortunately on this project, you can see where the ledge board was attached directly to our siding and that's a no-no. We wanna make sure that there was some type of barrier between. Luckily for the homeowner on this project, there are eaves above us and that means the water is actually going away from the house already and therefore there's very little water damage here. In order to avoid any further damage, we're gonna put flashing here and actually go up underneath our siding. That way, if there's any moisture that does hit our deck and hit this flashing, it's gonna be propelled away from our house, not towards our house. Simple enough. Since we are dealing with existing trim and siding, I did have to get a little bit creative with this flashing. So I took some general measurements, traced those out onto our trim, then cut those pieces out with a diamond disc attached to my grinder. Once each section is cut, I then bend it back and forth to easily remove those pieces that need to be removed and then slide it into position. I'll use some high quality silicone at the very bottom wherever the trim meets our metal as well as where our flashing meets our flashing. But keep in mind not all decks are able to utilize metal flashing like this. Sometimes you have to use deck spacers. These are called deck to wall spacers and they're specifically designed for this type of application where you're attaching them to the back side of your ledger board and then the ledger board is still being attached to your dwelling. This was a project that I recently did where I was attaching stairs directly to the house, but I didn't have anywhere to put a metal flashing trim piece, which is why the deck spacers are perfect because it allows air to flow as well as moisture to run down evenly and quickly. So there's no issue with moisture building up over time. We also installed this on this massive backyard renovation build that we did in Florida, where we knew this ledger board was gonna be going up against a concrete foundation, but there still needs to be a way for moisture to evaporate more evenly, which is why the deck spacers are perfect in this application. And since we're on the topic of new decks like this one, I'm gonna stay on the new deck theme for my last and final tip. However, I am going to give a bonus tip for any and everyone that has actually stuck through this entire video till now. And number 10 is gonna be knowing the three, four, five method, as well as the cross dimensional measurement and how important that is when it comes to having a perfectly square deck. And one of the key aspects of a deck is making sure it's square off the house. So we're using the three, four, five method, but we're actually gonna be making it and times in it by three because it's such a large deck. So if you take three times three from here to here is nine feet. Three times four, 12. So take that measurement from here over to here is 12 feet off of that mark. And of course, three times five is 15. So if I take my tape measure, try to do it by hand, and we'll run it all the way across, you wanna make sure that that line is very close to 15. If it is, that means you have a perfectly square deck off of the house, which is exactly what we want at this point. Let me know if you need any more clarity on that specific rule, but if you want something a little bit less complicated and more straightforward, it would be the cross dimensional measurement if you're able to do it. This method doesn't work for all decks because not all decks are squares or rectangles, but in those circumstances, you can definitely use this method. So the most important thing about this deck is the fact that you need to make sure it's square. And the reason why we did this tape is because if you stretch it all the way from this corner right here, all the way over there, that means that we have that measurement, which is 31 feet, 11 inches. Now I already took the tape from that corner over to here. I'll do it again, but that is also 
31 feet, 11 inches, which means our deck is perfectly square. And when installing a composite decking for a picture frame deck, that means that it's gonna be a lot easier to accomplish those perfect 45 degree mitered corners like this. And with that said, we can move on to our last and final tip, our bonus tip. If you're able to rent a walk behind or ride along skid loader, this has saved me so much time and energy and my personal physical well-being to rent these just for a day or two, which makes the process exponentially easier. And I put this as a bonus tip because in all honesty, I know not everyone is going to be able to rent one of these in their general area. But if you're able to, I would highly suggest doing it because not only can it move a large amount of earth extremely quickly and easily, but it also can drill your concrete footings very quickly with a 12 inch diameter auger bit. The sheer amount of labor that this saves is worth every single penny that you spend for a day or two renting it, and it can be delivered to a job site or a home in most circumstances. And that is my last and final tip on how to build a deck. But in my next video, stay tuned because we're gonna do my top tips on how to install composite decking, a little trickier than most. Uh, can't wait to show off this beautiful, sexy beast in all its glory. Oh yeah.